Hello, I'm Keith Barton and my remit is to talk about surgery in the advanced uveitic glaucoma patient. These are my financial disclosures. The role of the glaucoma specialist in the management of uveitis is firstly to manage angle closure and secondly to take pressure out of the equation in the long term so that it does not restrict management of chronic inflammation. In other words, we do not reduce steroids at the expense of chronic inflammation in order to reduce the eye pressure, as that is a false economy. What is advanced uveitic glaucoma and how is it different? Well, we're talking about severe angle closure um, requiring urgent surgery and uh, or advanced disc and visual field damage, which we're all familiar with from our uh, regular glaucoma practices. The visual field can obviously be um, difficult to measure and confusing in uveitic glaucoma due to media opacity and choroiditis, for instance. But I think you know what I mean, advanced visual field loss on the left, uh, significant paracentral defect that could cause loss of central vision on the right. These patients have a requirement to achieve a definitive long-term low target pressure. And I must reiterate again that this often requires surgery and, the, and we're talking about more definitive surgery rather than um, uh, less invasive surgery in many cases. Angle closure in uveitis requires special consideration as it is potentially devastating. There are three broad mechanisms uh, with different uh, management and different implications. The pupillary block group, chronic synechial angle closure, and central anterior chamber shallowing with forward movement of the lens IS diaphragm or phacomorphic. Pupillary block in uveitis is different from pupillary block in primary angle closure. This is primary angle closure, which is severe enough with relative pupillary block. Pupillary block in uveitis is often absolute, not relative. The chamber may be very deep, as seen here, and the uh, peripheral anterior chamber, not only shallow, but uh, iris stuck to peripheral cornea, and not just trabecular meshwork. So it's more dramatic than in primary angle closure. It's absolute, not rel relative. The sticky aqueous ensures that even if you do carry out a successful iridotomy in terms of reducing pupil block, the iris may still be stuck to the trabecular meshwork. Surgical iridectomy, on the other hand, permits viscoelastic injection uh, into the angle, reversing any temporary angle closure. And this is the fundamental difference between surgical iridectomy and laser iridotomy and angle closure in uveitis compared with primary angle closure. Laser iridotomy uh, is often ineffective and our anecdotal feeling that this was the case was backed up by this publication in the BJO last year, uh, accompanied by an editorial uh, by Gary Holland and I. This is a good example. Patent laser iridotomies have reversed the pupil block. You can see there's uh, a secluded pupil but on gonioscopy, the angle is completely zipped closed and the pressure is still uncontrolled. There was an opportunity lost here. What does surgical iridectomy offer that laser iridotomy does not? Well, it's quite simple as this. It is the opportunity to reverse transient recent adhesions um, by simply opening the, uh, the angle with viscoelastic. We're not breaking chronic synechiae here. We're reversing early synechiae that, that might become permanent should we not do this, and these are ones that would not be fixed by laser alone. At the same time, a surgical iridectomy can be performed here using vitrectomy forceps and scissors. You can also use the micro graspers from MST, or you can use a vitrector, or you can open up in the conventional way. With the surgical iridectomy combined with the viscogoniosynechiolysis, we can avoid the scenario of patent iridotomies in a closed angle. Chronic secondary angle closure is not something that you can fix surgically. It is really a predictor of uh, long-term uh, chronic pressure problems. Goniosynechiolysis here doesn't work. 
it bleeds and uh, in this publication angle surgery uh, was found uh, to be most successful whenever the angle was completely open uh, and PAS had a negative impact on success. Forward movement of the lens IS diaphragm uh, is obviously a very characteristic diagnosis to me, but most cases are actually iatrogenic. Even in uveitis, scleritis, VKH are, are rare, rare causes. Most are due to aqueous misdirection, big lens, uh, gas, buckle after vitrectomy. When IOP lowering surgery is required, trabeculectomy has a bad history in uveitis and tubes traditionally work well. However, the bad press of trabeculectomy is not entirely justified. I think if you're dealing with patients who have well controlled uveitis managed by a uveitis specialist and you case select patients who apart from the uveitis have no other surgery risk fa failure factors, the success rate can be very good as seen in this unpublished audit. The biggest risk factor for failure in, in this case series was actually uh, pseudophagia. You do have to treat trabeculectomy very carefully in uveitis. They have a young patients with a high propensity to hypotony. You do need to suture them tighter and be prepared to either use releasable sutures or laser suture lysis. In other words, you put in more sutures than you normally would. We have used the Zen gel implant uh, and successfully in uveitis as in this publication um, cited uh, here. We also presented our results uh, using the Preserflow implant in uveitis at the American Glaucoma Society last year in Washington, DC. However, in general, uh, subconjunctival MIGs are better for high IOP with mild glaucoma and not really for people who need one hit that will fix them in the long term. The, these patients really, if they have no other significant risk factors for filtration failure, these patients are still better with a trabeculectomy. And I must emphasize no risk factors for filtration failure other than the uveitis. If they've got significant failure risk factors, then it's a tube. And this can be ethnicity, single chamber, neovascular, previous conjunctival surgery, and certain types of uveitis such as JIA. And Although there are no randomized trials, there is a long history of successful tube surgery in uveitis dating back to Maltino and more recently the Barvelt. What about the risk of long-term hypotony? While in general, the Barvelt 350 works well in uveitis and it, it would be wrong to say that uh, they're at high risk of hypotony. There are certain types of uveitis where there is a high risk of hypotony and the barvelt is just too much in the long term. And these include JIA and uh, any severe uveitis that dates to early childhood. So the patient in their 30s had uveitis from the age of four years, years don't put in a barvelt 350. The patient in their 30s has had the uveitis for two or three years, then a barvelt 350 is quite reasonable. What do you do then? Well, then I tend to move down to either a 250 bar valve or the Ahmed valve in the, the ones that I think are a moderate risk of hypotony. Or if it's very severe uveitis from early childhood, I will still use a single plate Maltino implant. And they're, they're not, these are less seen these days. We still keep a couple on the shelf uh, for uh, patients. And, and I stent them in this, as you can see here. Finally, two take home points. I do not reduce steroid treatment just to reduce the pressure. Instead, I operate to take pressure out of the equation of the uveitis specialist. And in advanced uveitic glaucoma, this needs to be more definitive. So it's more often tubes and trabs. Um, trabs when there's no risk factors for failure apart from the uveitis. And tubes, depending on the type of uveitis, uh, whether it's a 350 bar valve or right down to a single plate Maltino. Thank you very much for your attention and for the kind invitation to speak.